appreciate everybody jumping on real quick. And this, what I want to do is kind of just take a half hour, 45 minutes, just to kind of just share one little process here with you. Uh, I want to start doing this, as I said earlier, uh, kind of once a month, kind of getting together on the topics. And what I'm going to talk about here is we're going to talk about the purchase timeline process. So like when you have, um, a building, uh, an apartment building under contract, or you know, wanting to go and purchase a property, I'm going to walk you through this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it step by step here, real quick, um, and show you the different steps in the process. So the first step would be when you're looking at a property. Let's say you get something off a of LoopNet or uh, you know CBRE, Richard, whatever. Is, Sorry is to, to interrupt, uh, Pat. Can you record it for? Yes, I actually I am recording it right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, no problem. That good, good suggestion. Um, so basically, you should visit the site or visit the area. Or in, in, in like if you're investing in Michigan, obviously take the time to drive over, drive past it, or meet the seller or broker at the site. What that does is kind of builds, you know, one credibility, and two you look at actually what you're looking at, at, at putting a property, you know, a purchase agreement on. Now what I've done here is kind of, this is if you're going to fly, if you're going to, you know, if it's out of state, you can kind of, it's a rough estimate about like $1,500, but let's, let's assume that you're in Michigan. So you would, you, you want to visit drive by it uh, or meet the broker there or meet the seller there. And I, I typically do that one to build credibility, but also two to, kind of let them talk, you know, cause they're, they're, they're people who own buildings. Typically they're very proud of it. So they'll start talking to you and you'll gather more information and you're kind of doing, you know, your due diligence, kind of doing your recon on the site visit. And, and it, it may be something simple, simple questions or something you see that you wouldn't have seen if you didn't visit the site. So that'd be the first thing when you're, let's say, let you call the seller or a seller's called you or you've got an OM from a, a broker is, okay, where is this property? Drive by it. Um, and then that's, that'd be the first step I would say to do. Now, the second step is if, if that looks good and you've, you've gotten the OM and you've gotten the trailing 12 and you've gotten the, the rent rolls and gotten the information from the seller, uh, now you may have to take a couple trips out there. And again, I try to do that and build up rapport. Well, I'll just meet you at the park or I'll just meet you at the, at the apartment. That way it kind of, you know, there's a common place, but you're, you're meeting him where, you know, in the building. So you get a different, you know, look at it. Oh, I'll just meet me in the back or the side or whatever. So once you get the information, and, and your, your LOI is the first step. In commercial real estate, we use LOIs or letter of intent. We don't go right straight into a PA, and I'll kind of explain why we do that. So you, and the LOI is, is basically just a, an outline of what the purchase and sales agreement is going to include. All right. Now I've got some boxes here. Now, depending on where it is, is, is you engage your contract lawyer. Um, you can do a couple different phases. I got an LOI template from my attorney many years ago. So I just use that. So I just tweak it here and there. So I don't typically use an attorney each time, but I would, I would definitely, you know, advise you to go and, and talk with an attorney, get something from him or get something from her and use that. Um, you don't have to use it each time, but again, I, I kind of have to disclaimer here, <laughs> please follow, you know, rules. But you, at that point, when you turn in your LOI, meaning when you submit it to the seller, you would then alert your lender. Typically you're talking to your lender before that to kind of get an idea of what you're going to put down. If you're going to go and get a mortgage, uh, you know, so you'd be talking to your lender, uh, obviously the lawyer as well too. And then also your management company, you know, if you're going to have somebody manage it or you're going to do it yourself, you know, and again, these are just suggestions. So what I'm trying to do is kind of just walk you through kind of a little bit of the process of how to do it. Uh, and we can dive in deep, you know, in the, in the meetup on any questions that we have. But So that's the first couple steps there. So the LOI kind of is an outline. 
basically, hey, listen, we're going we're gonna to buy this property for $2 million. We're going to do it seller financing and you're going to, you know, give us a 4% interest rate and five-year balloon. And what that does and the reason in commercial we do this is because so many things can change and it costs so much money to go into a purchase and a sale or a PA you're testing the waters here. So when you visited the site and talked to the seller on the phone or on, 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 on site, you're putting together what you've talked about when you're talking to him, when he said, Oh yeah, I'll do seller finance or I do this. So you put it all together and so he can see it on one page. And typically an LOI, depending on the size of the property is usually two pages, right? So it's not, it's not very long, but it, the meat of it is on the first page saying, here's what we're buying. Here's, here's our, you know, in the middle of the first page is here's, here's our financing. Typically I give three different, you know, seller financing, a cash offer and, you know, one with fin uh, financing. So, and, and it depends on what we talked about. So I would emphasize one over the other, you know, that way. So that's why we do an LOI because it's kind of your kind of negotiating back and forth a little bit with the seller at that point um, in, in the process. Let me stop here real quick. Anybody have any questions about anything that I've said so far? Is, is LOI always required or we can go directly to purchase agreement also? Um, you in commercial typically you do LOI. Um, now again, you can go straight to a purchase and sales agreement if that is what the seller you know and you guys you know have come eyeball to eyeball and you've shaken on things. You can by all means do that, um, but typically it's it's the LOI first because unless you know the person very well, that's where you kind of wash things out. But sure. you can. You, to answer your question, yes, you can. You can jump from meeting him or her, him or her, and then right into a purchase agreement. Sure. Yes, definitely. Good question. Okay, so let's continue here. So now the next part of this, and I've broken it up here, then we jump into the purchase and sales agreement. Now, the time from the LOI to the purchase and sales agreement, it can vary. Okay. Typically it's two to three weeks. Again, depending on the size of the property, you know, what you're negotiating, you know, you may, you know, shoot over seller financing and well, he talked to his wife and wow, he really doesn't want to do that. Now, can we do a, a purchase? Okay. So it's kind of a back and forth kind of thing there. Now I've seen it where you can, you know, go from LOI and, you know, two days later you're at the PA. I mean, it's, it just depends. Again, so the purchase and sales agreement, now that's or the contract or PA, that's when everything starts really happening, right? That's, that's where you put some kind of stuff. You've already talked to your lender. You've got a loan quote. You know what you're going to go for. Everything's solid, you know, as solid as it can be at this point before you get into your due diligence, meaning that you have your loan, you know, your broker knows, your insurance quotes are there, your loan quotes are there, you know, the closing cost, you're really solid getting that, you know, number really solid. And the only thing that will change is what you find in the next box or the due diligence area. That's the only thing that would really change those numbers in any drastic amount, meaning if you didn't know or nobody told you that it's in a floodplain or it's, you know, the, the roof is, you know, they've been covering up moisture damage and stuff like that. That's the only thing that would change. So in this purchase and sales agreement, again, you would engage an attorney to make sure you're covered on all the different angles of the PA. And again, depending on the size of the, uh, of the parcel, that you're going to buy, you know, it could be five pages, six pages, whatever. It just, it, it, so there's no real like standard, you know, length of that. But at that point there, you know, you would have typically 30 days to do your due diligence and typically meaning that you've put in a purchase and sales agreement and both you guys sign it, then that begins your due diligence period. Now, what you also put in your purchase and sales agreement is all documents relating to the purchase. So, and I misspoke. When you sign the PA, that doesn't start your, your uh, 
your due diligence period, when you receive all the documents that you've requested from the seller, that's when your 30 day or 60 day or 90 day due diligence really starts. And that's why you need an attorney to craft that kind of verbiage in there because you don't want to start doing your due diligence and not having all the contracts for the snow removal, the waste treatment, or the, you know, the, the trash removal or the, or the, all the uh, contracts for the cable. You want to put that in the, in your PA that my due diligence period will start when I have all the paperwork from you, Mr. Seller. I've requested bank statements. I've requested, you know, contracts for cable, for waste uh, uh, management, all the different things. And then, then my due diligence period starts because you've got a financial due diligence you're going to be doing and also a on-site physical due diligence. Okay, so one is you're digging into the papers, you're digging into the leases, you're going to have your property manager go lease by lease by lease, see when they expire, where all the security deposits are, and then the other side, you're going to be having a team of people in every unit going through each unit, you know, making a tick mark, okay, we got 20 units, 30 units, and okay, we got five of them that are, you know, totally inhabitable, or, you know, we got two or that are not, or one we need an AC, this. So you're going to have doing that simultaneously. You may think that 30 business days is a lot. When you've got to do that much work, that's where you need your team in place to go do that kind of stuff. Okay. So in that whole thing, you, then the, due, the earnest deposit would be put up in there. You'd be having due diligence fees. So third-party people, you'd be paying plumbers, electricians, um, depending on what kind of agreement you have with your property manager, you may have to pay for that. But again, what you're looking for in the due diligence period is a reason to not do the deal. That's your sole objective. So if anything, uh, and I'll give you a copy of this, this document here too. So right on there, that's the whole point of the due diligence period is, is find out why you won't do the deal. You want to find those, you know, ACs that are not working. You want to find all the different things going wrong with the property and, the, you know, the, in, uh, the insects or whatever it is. That's what your job is when you're doing due diligence. Because once you say, yep, I'm done with due diligence and I accept this, guess what? <laughs> it's now yours because <laughs> you're going to closing, right? So that's what you need to understand is the due diligence periods. That's why you're going to spend maybe uh, money on a phase one environmental. You may have to get a survey if the owner doesn't have a, another survey. So you're going to need, like I say up here, 10 to 15 grand. And now that is money that you're going to raise from your private investors. Okay or you have that money in your partnership or from you, and then you get reimbursed that money at closing. So you're never really out this money. So don't, don't think that you, you, but you can use that money from your private investors to do that and you get paid back. Okay. Uh, okay. So the next slide here. So we open bank accounts as well, because now we're, we're having to move this property to the next stage, right? So, Typically, there's five kind of a bank accounts that you're going to need to run a property. Now, again, this is for an apartment and, and it can vary. The reason I say that there's five is you don't want just one account for all the money. Okay, because you're going to, as you can see here, there's several different accounts that you're going to be using to pay your investors, to pay uh, earnest money, to, uh, to pay taxes. You want these separated. So the first account would be the operations account. That's general operation money, right? That's the run the property. The next one is the owner distribution account. That's where your, your monthly funds to pay things would be come into. Again, this would come on cash flow, and that would come out of the cash flow and go right into that. So you're not co-mingling funds. It's always a good idea. And again, this is just a suggestion to do it that you can set it up any way you want to, but I'm just from kind of experience, this is kind of, it works because then you know, okay, this checkbook is for this, this checkbook is that. 
you know, number three here, the deposits and earnings money account. That way you can then, if you put that money up, well, then you can go with that receipt and that sh uh, check and say, okay, here's the earnest money I put up. Here's the account. And it's, it's a clean transaction. Because you got to understand, folks, is unless you're doing this with your own money, I'm assuming that you're going to be having private investors or other people's money. So you have to be even more careful with people's money. And, and even, even though you may do this with your checking account at home, you're now dealing with other people's money so that you want to make sure that you can, you know, draw point A to point B. Okay. And then the fourth one is the, the self uh, escrow accounts for your taxes and your insurance. Now that for the taxes, the bank may require, the bank is going to require you to, to do that. They're probably going to keep an account. So they're going to, they're going to probably do that for you or request you to do with that because they're going to want the taxes escrowed along with your, um, your uh, CapEx as well. So if you already know that that going into it, that's going to make you look even more professional toward the bankers because they're, they're going to keep those funds separately. They're going to want to know where they're at. Again, going to organization. And then the fifth one is for your cap, CapEx expenses as well. So that's just a generic, you know, kind of five different accounts you're going to have. And again, you don't have to set this up until, like I said, in, in this stage here, when you know you have a purchase contract that you're, you're getting ready to sign and getting close, it's just one of these steps that you do uh, in the process to do that. Any questions about what I talked about so far? And I hope I'm not going too fast. What, what is this PPM startup? Yeah, PPM startup. Oh, I'm, that's good. Thank you very much. The PPM, uh, the, that's the Private Placement Memorandum. Uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. I missed that. That's where you're going to engage a securities lawyer uh, and get your Private Placement Memorandum started. That is the document you're going to use and give to your investors who are invested or are wanting to invest with you. Now, the PPM is a document, and again, depending on the size of the property, it is everything that could ever go wrong with an investment. It's basically, it's, 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 it's a document made to scare them, okay? <laughs> that's, that's for lack of a better word. The lawyer's gone in there and say, you, you're going to lose your principal, you're going to use your balance, you're going to do this, this happened, this happened. It's telling everything that could possibly go wrong with this investment you have to have that kind of disclaimer because if you don't, then if something happens, they can come back and sue you. So that's constructed by a, an attorney and uh, usually a real estate attorney that does syndication or a securities attorney. And it, like I said, it's a pretty good sized document, but that's kind of the fine print. Uh, let's say if you're buying stocks, you know, that, that fine print, you can use your principal balance, yada, yada, yada. And that's what that is. And you would give that to your private investors and you would tell them, Hey, listen, here's the offering that I'm here. Here's what I'm going to offer you. I'm going to offer you, you know, 8% return and 8% uh, preferred and, you know, overall, you know, 20% return. And Oh, by the way, here's the PPM. And they have to sign the PPM. They'll have to sign that and give that back to you and your lawyer so that they understand that this is a security, this is a financial tool that they could lose their money on. So that's, and that was a great question. And again, you'll create the LLCs as well. Um, you'll create an LLC for the property itself. So don't create LLCs beforehand because the bank will want a clean, brand new LLC the date of closing, they typically create the LLC and that you'll, your attorney will do that uh, for you because they, when you create an entity, they want it fresh that day. So there's no liens on it. It's typically in the name of the property, just like you do possibly maybe in your residential, it'd be, you know, main street, ABC, you know, LLC. And so they'll create that. They'll create an operating uh, account as well. So that's where you'd run your, you know, your A and B kind of shares out of that as well. That was a good question. Um, okay. So now once we've got this and now we're in the due diligence, we were going through the due diligence where everything is going good, right? One more question. Go, go right ahead. Um, 
do you know how much um, this PPM uh, document costs? Yeah, uh, well, it ranges. It's probably for, from $25,000 to $50,000. Thank you. And it just depends on the size of the deal, the hair in the deal, because there's typically a template they use. Okay, here's the PPM, and we, we're, we have to include 1 through 35. Okay. Oh, now this one's, you know, in, in a flood zone or in, in, in an area of town. Okay. I got to add these five other ones. So that's typically what it'll cost you. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good plan to have as far as money wise. It, you may possibly get it cheaper, but again, you want to make sure that the, the, the attorney that's drafting that is drafted before. So you're covered, yeah, but that's a great question. Heard. Then yeah. I thought maybe I'm mistaken. You know, I heard around you know uh, twenty five to fifty thousand. Yeah, it, it again, it just it, it just depends on what's you know it, they're all over the place really. But it, it's I'd rather shoot you high than tell you it's going to be two grand, and, and there, you're never going to get anything for that. I mean, it, it, it's that's you, you it won't. It just it just yeah, really but won't. It just uh, covers your hindsight. Yeah, it covers a lot of stuff, uh, but again, it's it, it is it is it is required if you're going to go raise money from private individuals. Now, if you're not gonna if you're not gonna let me see here if you're not gonna be doing, you know, a true syndication and and you're going to do a joint venture with people, okay, which That's is fine. different. Now you you wouldn't have to have the PPM, okay. And I probably should have prefaced that. I'm assuming here that you do a syndication, meaning you'd go and talk to people you know and bring them their money in. And that's a syndication. So if you're going to do a joint venture with family and friends, no, you wouldn't have to do the PPM. Okay. But you should have something, maybe even a little something stating, okay, ma, pa, aunt, uncle, you know, here's what the lawyer drew up. This is what can happen because again, you, you're kind of, you are looked at as the expert, whether you've done one deal, two deals, zero deals compared to, to a lay person that doesn't know this business. So you should, you should have something saying, Hey, listen, this is, this is what's, this is what we're looking at happening. And that's what the, 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 uh, the uh, opportunity package tells them, but you also just have to say, hey, listen, if stuff goes sideways and it can go sideways, here's, here's what we're going to do. You know, here, here's what can si go sideways. The, the bank can do this or, you know, we can run into this. But again, that's kind of in your, your, uh, your opportunity package as well. But I would have something and explain either face to face or have them sign something that you explain the, the downside of this investment, because I can tell you from experience, they're not going to remember unless you bring it up that they signed something that you told them they could lose principal or they could, you know, if we, we have to hold back a payment because uh, uh, damaged in during weather, you're going to get it the next filing month. Just cover your butt because when things are going great, Everybody forgets anything, right? When things go bad, they remember every little thing you said. And if you don't, you know, tell them. And you're you're not you're not scaring them. You're just being realistic with them because it could happen, right? It could. It, you know, you could have a fire at, at, that is no fault of your own, and and you may have to dis, displace people. Well, then all of a sudden now you can't make your distributions to your to your investors and. Aunt Mary's looking for that check, you know, and you're trying to do everything you can, you know, just, just cover yourself. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. So now what we've done is we're coming to the end and I appreciate you guys uh, sticking with me here. The hard red line is, you know, now we've, at, we're done with the due diligence, right? We've come to the last day. We've had our last extension. We, we have a real good feel for what this is. Um, you can still back out, but you're going to lose money. But like, like, like I've said, and, and I've 
people have uh, done, it's better to lose a little bit of money than to live with something that you can't do. But by this time here, there really shouldn't be any surprises that they're not going to have this deal go through. Okay. Now you may get some stuff thrown for you from financially, the bank's not going to do as much or the interest rate change, something like that. That's not really, let's say, a, you know, a, a, a drop the deal kind of thing. I'm talking finding out, you know, there's, you know, 40 dead bodies in the courtyard. You've already, you've already found all that kind of stuff, right? The skeletons are all things. So that hard line uh, is right there. By that time, then everything goes hard, means your earnest money and your deposit goes hard. Uh, and again, that's spelled out in the PA uh, and also the LOI. You try to get as less money down as possible. There may be a pro thing where if you want to extend your due diligence period, you release, you know, 5000 or 2000 or whatever it is. And again, depending on the deal. So it, each deal is specific, right? You know, you ask for 60, 90 days. If you want another 30 days, you release some funds that are non-refundable. But once you cross that line, your money goes hard, your earnest money goes hard, you're going to closing. Okay, so then the close, right? So you get into the close, all the money's, you know, start pulling together. You, you, should, be, uh, you should be getting all the money from the investors into, the, into, the, into your bank account and funding that uh, thing. So from that red line, you know, or maybe, you know, a couple days before that red line, you know, uh, somebody is, uh, goodness gracious, um, somebody is, you know, making sure that the money from all the investors is in the account. So when you go to the closing table, you can wire that money from the, the lawyer's account to the closing table and you can close. So it's, it's kind of a scramble. So you're doing, you're doing the property side, but you're also doing the money side. And again, this is if you're syndicating, this is if you're getting money from other people, even if you're getting from family members, double check, triple check, make sure it's in there because I can guarantee you, you know, Aunt Helen's going to transpose a zero and it's not going to get there. And, you know, you're sitting at the closing table and wondering what's going on. So, so you're doing a lot of different things and then you close, then bingo, bingo, you should close. If you can close closer to the beginning of the month. Why? So you can obtain the rents for that month. Okay. Now, you try to work it that way and sometimes it doesn't happen, but that's just a kind of a little, little trick you do to get it in there. Um, and then you'll get all those rents as well as the security deposits as well. And you now own the property. So that's, that's the real, that's the process. Anybody have any questions? So about the closing is right in the middle of the month. So you get half of the month's rent. Yeah, you try to close before the 15th, so you capture the, because remember, the rent's due on the 1st, it's late on the 5th, right? So yeah. if you close before that, you obtain those rents, not the seller. So try your darndest to close after the 30th to like the 5th or 6th, so you capture all that money. But that makes sense? Yeah, but if the uh, closing is right in the middle of the month, yeah, they just prorate it. A prorate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they just like they do with resident, they'll just prorate it. But yeah, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you shoot for that. And again, these are just kind of little rules of thumb that you can shoot for. Um, you know, try that. And what they do, they'll just prorate it. But it's always better if, you know, if it's already coming into the seller's account. He just cuts you a check from there instead of having to go back after closing and waiting for him with the check. You know, it's just sometimes you have to, but if you can, you can do it that way, it's, it's a good way to do it. Just real quick and easy. Uh, and again, everything I've talked about, this is, there's intersyncrasies or little, little things, but I wanted to share this with you um, to give you an idea of the process that you're going to go through in this. Now, again, like somebody said, yeah, you don't have to do the LOI stage, right? You can go right into a PA. You know, it, it just, you, but typically in commercial, you do an LOI to get a feeling for what, what you're looking at, make sure he understands the seller. Again, any one of these things you can change, 
but please, if you're doing this, definitely engage a lawyer, definitely engage, you know, a title company, a property manager, so you can go through these steps less pain than if you're trying to do it all yourself. And depending on the size of the deal, some of the stuff you're going to have to have a team because you can't be auditing the leases and walking every unit, right? I mean, there's just <laughs> too much to do. Was, was this, was this helpful? Was this, did you guys understand yes. uh, any yeah, questions? Question. Right. The question. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Hey, go ahead. Go right ahead with the questions. Yeah. This is Dominic here. Um, hey, Dominic, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Uh, so the question is um, during closing, the security deposit is clean because we know how much uh, they have it. And, and uh, during closing, you can, you can use that number and detect it. Uh, but what happens to the accounts receivable and accounts payable uh, that's already pending on the account for that property? How does it handle? Is it during closing? During closing, you don't see the books, right? How does it happen? Well, no, you, you would see the books during your due diligence. So you would, you would either agree with the seller in some fashion. If, if, if it's a lot of money, you either say, okay, at closing, write me a check and then we'll see what comes in and then the title company will reimburse. Always have a third party like a title company or a lawyer handle those kind of funds. So to answer your question, if it's a big amount and the seller thinks that it's going to come in before you close, then you say, okay, great. We'll put that in the, the, the PA that you just get, get over to the lawyer and get the money over to them. And then either the seller would pay that ahead. Let's say that, that let's say the account uh, the balance is, let's say $10,000. let just be a fee. He would pay $10,000 more at closing and then the title company would wait and get the bills from the seller and then release the funds back to the seller. See what right. I'm saying is you use the title company or a lawyer, typically the title company, to say, okay, we've got accounts payable of $10,000 and, and you know your security deposits and stuff like that. They would just take that and pay that into the seller, would pay that into the the um, the title company, none of the money will be released until the seller comes in and says, okay, I just got, I just got 8,000 of that 10,000 in here it is. And then you, you do it that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, you, the only question is, you know, uh, during due diligence, you know, they don't open their books, right? You know, the seller yes. will not open their own books, right? Yes. They, 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 you should be seeing their books. You should be seeing their bank accounts and okay. if you're not seeing that, then due diligence hasn't really started. So during the due diligence, you request, and there's a there's a list of stuff you request: bank statements for the last two years, you everything, deposit okay. slips, everything. So okay. you are getting everything now. If you're not, then obviously that's that's the problem because you have to see that you have, because once they sell the property, cause there's no sense of let's say privacy, right? It's not your personal account where after you sell this, they're going to keep it. When they sell this property, that bank account is going to be closed. Right. So there should be no reason for them. Oh, it's my, now if they're keeping it in their personal shame on them, but you need to see that. Okay. Yeah, always request that, and there's a list. I, I we can we can talk about that next week of the list of stuff that you request. You request that stuff, and again, going to that 30 business day loop underneath there, your time doesn't start until you get all the requested documentation, mm -hmm. because you're buying this property on you know million dollars on this this year. They're saying it's you know producing two hundred thousand in in income. Great, prove it to me. And they have to prove that. And that's that's what the due diligence part of the process is. Okay. Does that make sense? So what what happens to the account receivable if uh, let's say uh, one month rent was not received from three tenants, and how does that handle? You would have to agree some way with the seller, either he cuts you a check, or you just wait, or you contact the 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 tenant and have them pay you directly. 
That's something you'd have to negotiate. And again, typically it's only one or two. So typically it's not, but if it's like a sizable amount, then you would have, that would have to be a point of contention at the closing saying, okay, you know, we've got 20 people that aren't paying their, their rent. Either we get a credit, right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Mr. Seller, you're going to cut me a check. That's the, and I've seen it done both ways. Okay. Typically it's, it's not that much. And you've already have talked to them about that. So mm -hmm. hopefully at that time, obviously at the closing table, that's not going to be a huge issue. But again, those are the kind of things you still need to keep, you know, marching from due diligence or over that red line. If you see that's going to be an issue, yeah, that needs to be something saying, Hey, okay, hang on, Mr. Lawyer. We need to, boop, boop, we need to talk about it. We're missing 10 grand here. He's not giving me an answer to my satisfaction. Yes, then you can you can stop the process. Okay, <laughs> that, that's a great. Those are great questions, Dominic. That that's good. And again, that's why it's it's definitely recommend we'll have an attorney, a real mm -hmm. estate attorney with you, team members that can that can answer these questions and help you get this information. Because sometimes you 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 may not you try to you know get friendly with the seller, you know, but you don't know their state of mind and you always mm -hmm. want to have that third party, you know, to refer to, Hey, it's not me. It's the title company. You know, it's, Hey, it's, it's, it's not me. It's my lawyer. You know what I'm saying? So right. it kind of, Hey, we're on the same T do I, you want to sell, I want to buy, but geez, you know, I got to know what this thing brings in, you know, sure. the old bank, but that's a good question. Awesome. Any other questions? So uh, some people suggest uh, T12, you're saying 24. So is it better going uh, 24 months? Well, T12 is, is up here in the LOI stage. Okay, so, so you can get an idea of what the property is working. Now, when you get into the, the due diligence stuff, you're going to see all the books. So the T12 and the rent roll is typically done for the LOI stage. Now, if a guy or person can give you more than t12 by all means right but typically the minimum that you're going to do for an loi is a t12 and rent rolls current rent rolls that's what you're going to structure your loi on now when you go do due diligence you're going to see all the bank accounts for as long as they own the property you know all the way back and that's why you have to have a team in there to do that that makes sense yes sir. thank you Awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate these these questions, guys and gals. Appreciate it. Okay. Is there any anything else that I can answer? And remember, next week Wednesday is our mastermind. So I hope to see you guys there. We're in a new new room, new building. We're in the Forum Building. Uh, and that's in Central Campus at six thirty. I know it's it's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So I hope to see you guys and gals there. Um, and if you found this. Uh, you know, uh, helpful. Uh, if you have topics for other webinars, please let me know because uh, I want to start doing these you know, before uh, once a month at least just to get more information out there, to get, to get some, you know, good information out there so you guys can start making some offers. Is anybody making offers out there anywhere? No. Not yet? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> See, that's I why just, I got to keep doing it. I just sold these. my property. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Great. That's office building. Awesome. Uh, okay, good. Good. That's hey, great. Pat, I don't have your email address. You know, I have not met you personally. Okay. Is something that I, I can, I can give you my email address, actually. I can give it to you. It's pat, P-A-T, at opportunitycreator.com. And, man, you are, you are, that. that's good. Let me do that here. So it's pat at opportunity creator i'm kind of bad at self public self publicity i apologize it's pat at opportunity creator.com and that's the website as well but yeah email me um sure. love to see you at the mastermind uh next week it's every, uh the uh, for a third uh wednesday of every month um, unfortunately this wednesday i'm traveling oh, no, that's okay that's no problem that's so uh, that's why i'm going to be doing these webinars here uh sure. but definitely email me let me know um and then uh, again i wanted to keep this short and sweet Unless anybody has got any questions, this is going to be recorded. I'm going to put it on my YouTube page and I will send out a link uh, 
through the meetup uh, of where it will be to so you guys can view it again as well. Um, but listen, thank you very much for your attention and your time on a, on a Wednesday evening here. Thank I appreciate the input. You said um, that you're going to give us the slideshow? Yes, I can give you the slideshow as well as the video. Oh, okay. Thank yep, you. I can put that. In fact, I can put it in the Dropbox, and I, I can get it to you. So I can definitely do that. So I'll send that link out probably tomorrow morning, uh, and it'll be on the the, the YouTube as well. But uh, thank you for participating. And good questions. And, and I'm uh, when you say next Wednesday, if you put the date also, that will help a lot. Oh, that's right. Because I get uh, mixed up sometimes. There you go. See, you, you guys are gonna make me you guys are gonna make me do this stuff right, aren't you? <laughs> this is good though. I, I appreciate that. I, I do. I, I again thank you very much for that because again I I put this together and I okay, I, I know when it is. Well, yeah, you're right. So it's next Wednesday the twenty seventh, six thirty. And again, we're we're in a different building. There's a map on the meetup. Uh it's it's a a little bit bigger room. Uh but we'd love to see you guys there and gals. Uh if that's it, I'm going to let you go because I'm going to give you back 15 minutes because I said I was going to take you only 45 minutes. But unless you guys have any other questions, I'm going to let you guys go. Thank, thank you, Bud. So I appreciate it. Hey, thank you, gentlemen. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Bud. Bye-bye.